Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you to those of us who are here with us today on campus and those of us who are joining online. My name is Kathy Craven. I am the program director for the Media Communications Bachelors of Science program here at Full Sail University. I'm hosting uh, this session today called Life After Full Sail. Um, please put your hands together for Grant Schonkweiler, Jordan DJ Swivel, <laughs> Stephen Barris, and Keith Garrett. Thanks for being here, guys. So as we, I know you guys have all read the, um, your app, you have your app downloaded, you're all into that, you've read the bios, but I thought I'd just let each one kind of give their own version of what they do in the industry uh, right now, and then we'll get into a question. We won't let them get away without asking about life after full sale starting from graduation. So um, we'll start with you, Stephen. Just tell us a little bit about what you do. Oh, sure. Uh, I'm Steve Barris. I work for HBO. We make television shows. Um, namely Game of Thrones. <laughs> namely Game of Thrones, yeah. Uh, I work on Game of Thrones, Westworld, and Sesame Street uh, directly, and my team supervises uh, production operations for original programming. Thanks, Stephen. Keith? Uh, my name is Keith Garrett. I am a real-time visual effects artist. Uh, I was the lead effects artist at Naughty Dog for almost eight years and took off about two years ago to sort of explore a little bit more. The industry is changing so much, so I wanted to take a step away and see if I could get a different perspective on it. And uh, about a month ago, I actually opened up my own visual effects studio. Cool. Uh, <laughs> All right. I'm uh, Jordan Young. Uh, you can call me Swivel, and I make music. Wow. Com <laughs> complicated right there. Uh, I'm Grant Schonkweiler, and uh, I most recently was a producer at Epic Games, and now I am figuring out my life. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm, uh, let me know when, you I'm know, let us all know how that goes. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, uh, I, I took six months off to kind of recharge my batteries, and now I'm doing consulting work uh, in the production space of games. Nice. All right, guys, so it's graduation day. Take yourself back. Uh, you're off the stage, you've taken all the photos, you've had all the parties, and then what? What's on your mind about work? Go back to that time. What are you thinking about work at that point? Well, well, the first thing I did was I went skydiving. Good so call. So I was yeah. like, I just got to do something death-defying because I just spent, you know, the whole time at Full Sail doing, like, what I thought was death-defying. Um, for <laughs> me, I was, I was very lucky to have a job lined up three months before I graduated. Um, and so my first thought was, um, you know, how do I come into this new job, learn a lot, but also show them that, that I know what I'm doing? To an extent, obviously, you want to come in and you want to be humble, but you also want to prove that you're valuable as soon as you come in. So um, I, I had the job, I had done all the research, I had figured out the company, I knew where I was moving, I had all that lined up, so it was just a matter of studying. I just kept studying like I was here at school. Um, I, I took a little bit of a break and kind of let my mind sit for a little bit, but the two weeks before I started, I was just rereading through books on C++ and re relearning how to do different things, because um, you want to you want to come in and instantly prove your value, um, and then at the same time you want to be humble and be like, I'm here to learn, but I can do this. Um, and that's basically what happened. Is I came in and they were like, Hey, you've done audio programming, and I'm like, Yeah. And they're like, Cool, you're gonna rewrite our audio engine. And I was like, oh, Okay, yeah. <laughs> All right. So they stuck me in a room and I did that for like two weeks. So just awesome. my main thing was be prepared. Awesome, like a Boy Scout. Yeah, <laughs> I was a right. Boy Scout. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, Swivel, what do you, what do you, what were you? Um, I kind of knew that I was going to move to New York uh, a few months before graduation. I had a little during the spring break. I went up and checked it out, uh, and I had lined up an internship uh, at a studio up in New York. So I, I uh, two days after graduation, I took a flight and never looked back. Um, so I started that internship and. Lasted a few months there, didn't really like the vibe at the studio, so I quit and then uh, um, worked with career development. And a few months later, I found the internship that eventually led me to, you know, where I am today. So that was the first four months out of school. All right, yeah, yeah. just a few things. Yeah. <laughs> All right, what about you, Keith? I had a fairly standard departure. So uh, when you graduate, you hit this like really low point of depression. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> partially kidding. There's there's this overwhelming 
sensation that you have of like, okay, now what? Because yeah. you're no longer guided out of here. Uh, for me, so my actual departure from, from Full Sail was uh, I went through the animation program and then immediately knew that I wanted to learn more about business. Business is what runs the world. Money runs the world. Uh, and I was young, and so I didn't really know much about how the rest of the world works, and I knew that I wanted to learn more. So I went into the business program. Uh, and once I finished the business program, I was working with some of my classmates on a cool project in the local area and needed a job. And so uh, Brian Whitehurst, the visual effects instructor at the time, um, offered me a position as a lab instructor. And so I started teaching here and kind of fell back in love with visual effects specifically and compositing and sort of the, the art form. And I had a student ask me how do game effects work, uh, and I, I really didn't know. And so I went home and I started learning and realized, like, wow, I actually really, really enjoy this. Uh, and because I was enjoying it, I was spending a lot of time just working on it on, on my own and building up that set of skills and posting my work online and sort of soliciting, like unintentionally soliciting myself online. And I started getting job offers um, just by putting myself out there. And then uh, through career development, uh, I landed my first job at High Moon Studios, moved to San Diego, and it kind of just took off from there. Nice. I bought an ambulance from High Moon Studios once. <laughs> Did you really? You know, yeah, Lee. What's his name? Lee something. Like a technical director there or something. He and his brother had an ambulance. <laughs> that doesn't surprise me at all. It was for <laughs> sale. Just there was a boat that. in the backyard, too. That's was there? Yeah. 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 No, it's a <laughs> I've always <laughs> needed one of those. Small world, right? You never know when you need an ambulance. <laughs> you never know. You, huh. want it, you want it to be there. <laughs> you never know. You never know. When you get to a point in your career where you need your own ambulance, then you know. <laughs> <laughs> Hall of Fame week. Unfortunately, the, the logistics of driving it and using it are a little tough. Yeah, I did totally <laughs> on the way home from getting it. We stopped at uh, Portillo's, uh, <laughs> and uh, we, uh, we did, like, somebody was blocking the parking lot. We did turn on the, the, the lights oh, and amazing. sirens for a second, just give them a quick... Uh, yeah, Get out of the way, you know. We're gonna, <laughs> gonna get in the drive-through with this thing. So, yeah, no, it was, it was a good time. I didn't even know that. There you go. Yeah. Okay, so you walked off the a graduation stage. Pictures are taken. Parties yeah. are done. Yeah. What are you thinking about work? Well, I had, um, you know, read an article in Post magazine uh, maybe a few months before I had graduated about a, a gentleman, uh, Christopher Coppola, Nick Cage's brother. Francis Ford Coppola's nephew, who was uh, shooting a uh, film, one of the first films called Bloodhead, a uh, horror film on the, you know, sort of one of the first HD tape cameras. And there was a guy sort of quoted in that article who was his, you know, sort of post coordinator or something on the show saying, you know, I think oh, this is going to be a big, uh, I'll do it in Michael's voice, I think, oh, this is going to be a big deal. <laughs> Great. Uh, you know, they really wanted to be able to essentially uh, finish the show themselves all inside of the show with gear that they could sort of acquire. I had worked for Apple before coming to uh, Full Sail, uh, worked in the Final Cut Pro, um, you know, sort of team. It was a product evangelist for, uh, for Final Cut Pro. And, uh, you know, a lot of the reason that I came to Full Sail in the first place was this idea of it's maybe time to stop watching people and telling people how to do these things and actually see if I can do some of this on my own. I'd worked in the physical production side for a long time um, before I before I, I worked with Apple. Um, but post was really sort of something I was I was very interested in, very passionate about. And so um, I called uh, Michael uh, Chioni, who'll be here uh, on Thursday, induct me into the Hall of Fame, which is embarrassing. <laughs> um, but uh, I'm very praise averse, so this is a this is an interesting week for me to be constantly praised it's by. It's just gonna get worse. Uh, I know. It's just uh, yeah. So uh, bear with me. Uh, uh, I need this a, a certain amount of self-deprecating in every story to just sort of cope with the week. Um, so that balances it out. Uh. That's nice. So I gave him a call and I said, uh, you know, listen, I've you know graduating. I think that there's really something in what you're saying about sort of building this post house around commodity hardware, commodity software, being able to offer these very high end services, but at a you know in a price bracket that can address a, a consumer that is you know just not served at all. And so uh, I flew out to L.A. We had you know lunch and, and uh, a day of meetings. Uh, weeks later, they moved into a building uh, on Sunset Boulevard. Weeks after that, I joined them uh, there and. Uh, uh, and the rest is history. I don't know. As it turns out, we ended up uh, sort of filling a market a gap that sort of coincided with film festivals accepting projects 
in a digital format instead of just on film, which lowered the barrier of entry for independent filmmakers. And we happened to be the post house that served that entire market for, uh, you know, for a significant uh, number of years. Our first year in business, I think we had, I'm not sure, Mike will know absolutely, but a dozen uh, sunset, or, uh, uh, Sundance films uh, that, that, uh, that we worked on and, and year after year, uh, more and more of that. Uh, so, yeah, so that's, I, I called a guy and see if he wanted to start a post house in LA. So, <laughs> I wouldn't suggest that path for everyone, just so you know, that's a, uh, it's a lot that, of work. That's, worked out. that's really amazing as a student that you were just like, I'm going to call this guy. And you did all that research. And, that and it just turned out that he wasn't, he wasn't a total dick. Yeah. And so it, it worked out. It worked out. But, you know, I still give that advice today. You know, the interesting thing is, is like people who work in everything below the people that you read in the first four credits of a movie yeah. don't have any fans. No, no <laughs> one knows who, who any of those people are. And you know what? If anybody reaches out to them and says, you know, I'm not a, just a fan of Game of Thrones, but let's say Alan Freer, our, our uh, post supervisor. If you reach out to Alan and say, Alan, I'm a big fan of the work that you've done. You know, first of all, obviously I love Game of Thrones, but I also really like Your Highness or other things. You know, how did, what was your path? How did you get to where you are? Would you mind talking on the phone for two minutes? Most people would say yes. Yeah. You know, most people are actually pretty cool and, you know, want to talk. Everybody loves talking about themselves, yeah. except for me. Um, <laughs> you know, every, everybody, you know, will give you five minutes. And that sometimes is enough. Then five minutes is, it's your job to, you know, make that into... 20 minutes or an hour. Yeah. Right. So you're in that, that first, you know, job, one or two jobs. And um, tell us about a time that you may have felt in over your head when you were like, I'm going to say yes to this, but I have no idea what I'm doing. I feel like that's every day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I, I would agree with Keith. Like, if every day you weren't a little bit scared, yeah. then you aren't being challenged. So you should find somewhere else to go. For me, it was literally I walked in the door and they were like, take like a little bit, they had their own engine and they're like build Pong and they're like take a week to learn the engine. I built Pong in like 45 minutes and I was like, I did it. And they're like, okay, well go rewrite the audio engine. And like <laughs> I, I had told people I was an audio programmer because my, my background was audio show production and, and I moved into games and, and I was like, okay. And I was terrified because I didn't know what I was doing. And then like the project I did right after that was to go in and look at assembly code, which for any of the programmers out there is literally a nightmare. And literally every night I dreamed about assembly code. <laughs> and I, I had an, the same recurring nightmare for like a year after that. But, but that taught me very quickly that it's like, if you're willing to just do the jobs that nobody else wants to do, then you get to do the jobs that you want to do, Yeah. right? So, so I did a bunch of the things that nobody else wanted to do and that were scary. And then eventually I literally got to do whatever I wanted, so. Chased by incorrect syntax for like <laughs> a whole one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Don't understand why it won't be I mean, a mile. The, the, programming nightmares. Yeah. <laughs> the interesting thing about the industry is like, if you're an artist, if you're purely an artist and you're in a, a medium that allows you to be just an expressive artist, then you're making art and it, you have no idea if your next piece is going to be as successful as your last. Yep. So that's terrifying. Or if you're a tool user, the tools are changing daily. I mean, I'll wake up in the morning and somebody else has innovative something, innovated something that I've never heard of before, and now it's my job to go into work today and hope that I can learn it in time to use it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's never comfortable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I it's always on, exciting. Though. I worked on a game and we built it in a weekend, and it was more successful than a game that we spent four months on. Mm. Right. Like these were small, like mobile games, but seriously, we built a game in a weekend and it was very successful. We spent four months like slaving over this other game, and like no one played it. So you, you really do. You never know. You're yeah, like, yeah, this is it. This yeah. is going to be a great game. And then no one plays it. <laughs> yeah. And then you cry. I think uh, the scariest moment for me um, when I was doing uh, Beyonce's record, midway through the album, uh, she was uh, putting out her, her uh, DVD for her, her world tour. And it's a surround sound project and all this. So she got the mix back. Um, I initially didn't do the mix. Uh, and she got it back and she hated it. Um, and so the production company and her sort of said, hey, can you, can you mix this? I've never mixed in surround before, uh, and it was a 90-minute uh, uh, DVD that one of the day's audio was lost completely. <laughs> uh, none of the crowd noise from the, it was recorded at the O2 Arena in London, none of the crowd noise was usable because they put the mics on the ceiling, and you don't, you know, in one of those, sh you want to get close crowd noise, right? 
Um, so we had to re-record the whole thing. So they just said, all right, can you do it? We've got like, you know, a week. And how much do you want? And I just <laughs> thought of the most ridiculous number that I could say. And then they agreed way too quickly, and I realized that it was <laughs> far too low for the job. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, the next closest bid was $30 million. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I was like, oh, I spoke too soon. Um, and I ended, ended up getting sort of thrown in the fire and doing it, and it, it turned out really well. She went, you know, multi-platinum, whatever, and, and uh, did really well for her. Um, but that was something I'd never done before, never even attempted to do, never even thought I wanted to do. Uh, I still don't really want to do it, but <laughs> at least I know now I can do it if I needed to. Um, and yeah, so so I think that was the, the scariest moment for me. Nice, yeah. nice. So yeah. you probably never had any scary moments. No, it's pretty much been smooth sailing. <laughs> um, no, I mean, you know, it's interesting because we recently learned this this term, which I guess is a software development term of a minimum viable product, um, which I, mean, I, I don't think it actually sounds as bad as it is, but it's funny because we've sort of started to look at, like, the, the original programming philosophy might be maximum viable product, <laughs> meaning, like, what is it that we can do before this thing is, like, taken away from us? Like, how can we... And I mean, every day we have uh, a creative show up, and I mean, David and Dan, our showrunners for Game of Thrones, might be the worst of the of the lot, and by worst I mean the best because they show up having watched a bunch. You know, I don't know when they watch movies, but watching all these feature <laughs> films and saying like, that's what our show should look like. That's how we should. And then it's up to us to sort of figure out, you know, and the hundreds of people that work on the show, how do we accomplish this inside of, you know, a, a 12 month schedule? How do we get so, no, I mean, every day it's about, you know, and, and in an industry where most people are shooting on the same camera, um, you know, most program formats are about the same. There are a hundred medieval shows out there right now. It's how do we give people a totally different perspective? How do we shoot the show? How do we light the show? How do we costume? How do we visual effect? Um, and how do we get the best talent to sort of, you know, combine together into this sort of perfect thing in less time than they shot, you know, all of the Lord of the Rings films. Mm -hmm every year. <laughs> so we do about the same amount of work as the first Lord of the Rings film uh, every uh, 11 and a half months. Uh -huh. and, and they shot that film in over three and a half years. So, you know, it, it, it's just the sort of the pace, the velocity that we have to work at it means that just everyone has to be constantly sort of, you know, <laughs> I think Gary said this morning, like, this is either the, uh, or Tammy, <laughs> this is either the thing that sort of, uh, you know, gets you fired or gets you promoted. Yeah. And you're sort of, but if you're not kind of in that state all the time, I think if you're not working towards the maximum viable product all of the time, then, uh, you know, I think that you're probably producing a lesser than product, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's plenty of lesser than products out there, but, um, you know, I think if you look at things that affect people at, like, a culturally significant level, which we've been embarrassingly, uh, you know, a, a part of many times now, um, you know, it, it, it does mean it's a product of the people that do that, and, and those people are doing the very best work that anyone is doing in their particular vertical. So uh, there is a huge amount of pressure to be the absolute best at, at, at what you do all the time. And that just means, I mean, you know, it actually, to me, it means it's coming here. It's seeing what it's seeing what people are working on. It's seeing what's new. It's understanding what's happening in other industries. You know, game design is something that I'm fascinated in uh, because I think a lot of what's happening there uh, is stuff that we're just starting to sort of realize we can do in visual effects. A lot of real-time engine hardware and stuff is allowing us to do that. And it's stuff the game industry has been doing for, like in some cases, you know, almost a decade. Yeah. And we're just sort of discovering it. And I think the more that our industry blends other industries, same thing with recording. I mean, the, the things that we can do now with uh, on-set sound capture for spherical video or for Atmos or for whatever, you know, that all comes from, you know, that all comes from music. And we borrow from all of those disciplines so heavily. And so, you know, we have to be very invested in understanding what everyone else is doing so that, you know, we can ultimately steal that and, and yeah. claim it as our own. <laughs> it's, it's interesting <laughs> what you said about the, like, the, the staying hungry and, and coming here and seeing students and, and their like drive. I, I recently uh, just finished a book called Originals and uh, they talk about this theory in there where people who are in the middle of their careers, like they don't, they don't try. 
Right. And so people at the top are, are constantly striving to be better and people at the bottom are constantly striving to be better, but people who are in the middle tend to settle in their careers. Yeah. And so it's like, it's really interesting because I mean, you're obviously at the, t like at the top and you guys are striving so hard to keep innovating and keep learning from new people, even though you're arguably one of the most popular shows on television, sure. but you're still like, we want to do something new. We want to do something different. And it's just like, what a student is. Well, I, I think, and it's, it's funny because I think that television entertainment space in general is so much, but what have you done for me lately, yeah. right? I mean, how many times have you heard, oh, the first season of that show is great, but I don't know what they did in the second season. <laughs> it's not very good. I'm watching this over here now. Like, have you seen that? Like, it's yeah. great. And so everyone is lining up to take our place. And so, yeah, we have to be, you know, and, and we're lucky to work with some of the people who guess right the most out of maybe anybody sure. I know in that, you know, they're, they're making the right decisions and doing the right things. And uh, yeah, so no, but that, that's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. I mean, you have to sort of stay so engaged all the time because otherwise then, yeah, then, then you're forced to settle because the world moves past you. Yeah. So. <laughs> so what, so let's kind of drill down a little bit. So you're sitting there, you get this, you know, it sounds like, Steve, every day you are actually living in a little bit of fear, but you're handling it really well. Constant fear. <laughs> yeah. Constant so, state of panic. But how, how and, and with that in mind, so to each of you, uh, you, are, you, you hear, this is, this is your new task. This is what you've got to do. Um, you're feeling terrified, especially maybe in the beginning of your career. What, and in that moment, how, what advice do you have to get through that moment and just put yourself out there? Well, for me, I, I mean, that's part of why I started skydiving, because skydiving to me is like you, you face a, a fear every time. And because of that, I now I'm not scared of anything. And the potential for actual death. Yeah, yeah. It's which I think is, <laughs> yeah, I mean, puts things in perspective. Puts in now, now, once you skydive, you know it's yeah. the same as getting in a car and driving. But anyways, it's like. Not that quite moment. the same. It's a little, <laughs> just a <laughs> little. Anyways, whatever. But uh, I hear it's windier. <laughs> it's yeah. a bit windier. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> but it's to me, it's the same thing I do when I stand in the door. Someone says, "Do this thing." That's terrifying, right? I I I tell people the most paralyzed I've ever been in my career is the day I quit Epic, and the next morning I woke up and realized I didn't have anything to do. Mm. It was the first time in mm. 20 years I didn't wake up and have a job to go to. Mm. And I just sat there and I was like, and I literally laid in bed for four hours, like staring at the ceiling, like. What do, what do I do? And, and so when something comes to me and I'm, I'm scared, I just stop, I breathe, sit there, kind of think about it for a few seconds, and then go, all right, well, let's do it. I mean, that's, you, you just have to tell yourself, I can do this. Like, and sometimes if it's really scary or really hard, I think about all the other scary hard things that I've accomplished, and I'm like, oh, well, it's not worse than you know, like surviving this or doing that. So it's right. like, all right. I, I think that perspective is, extremely important. I mean, I think there's, you, you eventually have to realize that there's a huge difference between risky and scary. Mm -hmm. uh, and risky means that there's like, there's a really strong negative side to that. And so you have to become extremely risk averse to protect yourself. Most of the time when we come up with challenges that we're afraid of in the day, it's something scary. It's not necessarily risky because we have a team of people around us that are there to support us and we're all trying to succeed together, but it's scary as hell because it's on me. Uh, and so in that point, you also just have to get rid of your ego and you have to just acknowledge that you are a student. And the faster you can get rid of that and the faster you can warm up to just know that you need to ask questions to everybody that's willing to help you, Absolutely. the faster you're going to get through that and become an expert. Mm. Yeah. Awesome. Good. Google. Yeah, well, and I think, you know, Great it's tool. <laughs> you leave school and you, you face one of those challenges and the more mentors that you have that you can, I can say, like, when I started in, I moved from theater to um, live theater to, to uh, television production, uh, to, to film production, I started in the prop shop at Paramount, and when you need to build things, and very quickly, and very efficiently, very cost effectively, and you've not been doing that up to that point, uh, Tracy Nunley, who's a, a professor now at Northern Illinois University of uh, Theater, um, he was my mentor at Theater Calgary where I started my career and I would call him all the time and say like I've got to mill something out of titanium how do you do that like what cutting fluid do I use you know or, or whatever and that network just grows and grows I still do that today and what makes a really good producer charity and I were talking about this what makes a really good producer is your ability to be one degree away from the person that can do whatever it is that needs to be done or knows how to do it or knows the person that knows it and now it's like you know and you look at it like again I come back to the movies maybe but you 
you look at a movie like Jurassic Park, you look at the guys who worked on that, Phil Tippett, Dennis Murin, uh, you know, all these guys who are not just master fabricators, but like master movie makers, and you look at the behind the scenes stuff, and they all rely on each other, you know, like, yes, the dinosaurs were digital, but people didn't really know how to puppeteer digital things yet, so they built Phil Tippett a little model that he could puppet because he knew how to make things look like they moved for real better than an animator could because that just, that job hadn't been invented yet, <laughs> and it's like, that's a perfect example of all these different people, you know, Dennis Murin know how, knows how to make a great looking dinosaur, but can't build it, you know, and so, he, you know, he calls Stan Winston, and Stan Winston and his guys build amazing, you know, sometimes working mechanical dinosaurs, but like, at the end of the day, you watch that movie, and it changed the way that we thought about what we can do in movies, the worlds we can take people to, and it's because, you know, this guy calls this guy, calls this guy, calls this guy, calls that girl, calls him, and, and, and pretty soon you have this team of amazing people, and those people now, uh, some of my good friends work at, at Legacy, which is the, the company after Stan passed away, um, and they literally, I mean, there's nothing they can't build. You can ask them, they build Iron Man armor and stuff now as their sort of specialty is, uh, is armored suits, but there's literally nothing you can think of, and if they don't know, they'll say, oh, you know what, I met a guy, and now we do all this 3D printing, and oh, you know what, we needed this, and now we do uh, uh, CNC loom weaving, which I didn't even know was a thing, <laughs> um, but they do that now, we do screen printing, we do it, and, it, and, and it's so, it's about building, and we say networking, like, well, it's a cliched networking thing, but it's, it's not networking like, let's go to a party and shake as many hands and collect business cards, but it's like, Ask somebody what they do, yeah. and if you don't know what that is, that's a fantastic contact. Have them explain it to you in detail. <laughs> People love talking about themselves, so you know, like, oh, I'm a, you know, I'm a uh, hydro simulator, uh, you know, uh, code developer. What is that? <laughs> what do you do with that? You know, how does that work? You know, and so, uh, you know, I, I didn't. That, that, I think, is a great way when you are terrified at that moment of, you know, we need to run a camera at 35 miles an hour over a crowd of dead bodies. You know, how, how do you, we do that? <laughs> I got to gotta get on the phone. I'll let you know. In an, uh, I don't know, but we'll figure it out. I'll, I'll, let's talk again in a couple of hours. I got to make some phone calls. I call that my super nerd list. I believe that every nerd really just knows other nerds that are experts at their thing. That's exactly so it's right. Like, it's like, oh, this is broken in my computer, and I'm like, I don't, I, okay, I Googled it for 10 minutes, I don't know, so I'm going to call this guy because that's his yeah. field, so it's yep. like my, my super nerd list. Exactly, <laughs> yeah, and one, you know, it is. It's, it's the Avengers of, uh, of nerddom, that's, <laughs> that's what right. you need, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. but I, I think just to, just to concisely summarize this, I, like, nothing in this industry that we're in happens in an individual. Yeah, that's like exactly we're, we're up here, but and I, this is such a cliche statement on the shoulders of giants, blah blah blah. But like at the we're end literally of the day, on the shoulders of actually, giants. Uh, in this case, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, uh, but yeah. like we have <laughs> teams of people that we work with that are there to support us. So when we struggle, we have other people around us, and that's what builds a good team is that you have people that can counterbalance each other's strengths and weaknesses. Yeah. Well, and I mean, you have a pool of uh, nerds, nerdesses, and uh, various other disciplines here that are, I mean, massive in quantity. Oh, yeah. I mean, just in this room, there we could probably, uh, you know, figure out how to, you know, launch swivel over the parking lot in some sort of improvised uh, vehicle. If Why, is to. <laughs> Why is it me? Why is it going to be me? Win a Grammy, you get a lot of shit for the next guy. few weeks. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, exactly, right? We've got parachute expertise. Where's that sword? It's all you right now. Where's that sword? <laughs> you know, yeah, exactly. In the grammar, right? Yeah. So it's like, this is just, uh, what, uh, you know, not even, not even 50 people, and I'm sure there's a huge skill set in this room. Think about this building. Think about this campus. Every time I come here, it's like another shot. Every shopping mall around here has got to be like, <laughs> oh, it's only a matter of time until the, you know, Gary <laughs> drives over there and hugs everybody out into the, you know, it, you know, it's only a matter of time. Everything's going to be gray and, and orange thanks, at some buddies. point. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. Love you, brother. Let's get you in your car. Head home. We're going to find your... Chinese restaurant, we're going to find you a great new building. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to get you out of here, though. So, you know, like, it's, it's true. It's amazing. Like, you think just the, just the volume of intellect uh, on this campus is, is awe-inspiring. So, yeah. you know, start to build that network here. Start to build your, uh, your nerd list, uh, you know, here. I mean, there, 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 there are people on this campus building a mech simulator. Yeah. Like, a, a mech simulator. Like, a robotic <laughs> mech, like, from Gundam. Like they're building a Gundam on this campus. And Ramsey like, literally just said, "I gotta go. I gotta deal with some robots." Yeah. Go. <laughs> <laughs> what? Deal with some robots. What are they doing here? I want to come. What back is to Gary's school, ultimate <laughs> plan? <laughs> the drone army. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm glad to hear you guys saying that because, um, from my perspective, I hear students all the time, uh, basically 
someone has placed in their head that once they graduate, they're completely alone. And, um, you know, we try to instill while they're here to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's beyond networking, like you said. It's the actual, like, you know, make a friend. Yeah. And, I mean, yeah. I think you, when you do graduate, you are completely responsible, maybe for the first time in your life, um, <laughs> you know. But that doesn't mean at all that you're completely alone. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you now are in charge. Um, but you are not isolated, you know, you are, you are certainly, uh, you know, not set on a raft and sort of pushed out into the ocean with a, you know, a couple of coconuts and a good luck. It, it really is that, you know, you now are the leader, uh, you know, you are, you know, you are traveling on your path and you get to decide what that is now. Nobody is going to tell you when you have to wake up or what 2 a.m. lab you have to show up for or whatever, uh, or what to spend all that money on. Well, you probably have all bought a stereo Costco by now because that's, <laughs> what, that's what financial aid does. Um, but, you know, it's now, it's, it's up to you. But if you've done what you need to do while you're here and you've met the people that you need to meet and you've done the reading, you've done the studying, you've, you've, you've built your, your network, then you're very much not alone. And, like, the number of times I hear, like, well, this full Stealth student and I are working on that, and right. oh, I met these guys at full Stealth. I mean, I still have a half a dozen friends that I see all the time who were in my class, uh, you know, at, at, at Full Sail. I work, I've worked with many of them, and, um, you know, so they're, you, 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 we're with these people forever. You can't get rid of them. So. <laughs> Even if you try. <laughs> Even if you try. Yeah, I mean, I would say half of the, the help that I've, more than half the help that I've, I've had growing this new business, I've never run a business before, and I'm, I'm trying to run one now, and most of that assistance has actually come from other Hall of Fame members or people that I meet and frequently see coming back here to the school. Mm -hmm. Like this school fosters the attitude that wants to share that as well. Yeah. So the alumni is is more often than not, like you said, mm -hmm. super willing to, to reach out and help. Yeah. I, can't, I can't even count the number of people I've hired that I met at Full Sail. Yeah. I can't even count. I mean, it's, it's, it's not just that I've met when I was here, but that I meet every time I come back here because mm -hmm. like, it turns out most of the students are smarter than me, so <laughs> that's cool. <laughs> the fly fishing video Let's guy. I'm reaching out to the hey fly fishing video <laughs> guy for sure. So uh, you guys are talking a lot about this fast paced how you got to keep up with it. You got to keep going. So we don't talk enough here at Full Sail about how do I balance my life. <laughs> you know, how do I actually have a life and be at the top of my game? I'm gonna throw it to you, Grant. You quit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you very much, everybody. All right, good call. <laughs> thank you, everyone, for coming. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, uh, no. I think this is something that's very dear and very passionate to to me because as a, as a as a producer, my responsibility is the health of the studio and the health of the people on the on the studio. Uh, and I think for me, when I realized that that being creative or being a programmer or any of those things for too long can break you. Um, I like to tell the story of uh, when I was working on Rage at id Software, we were working 90 hour weeks were our short weeks because um, we built a tri AAA um, uh, multiplayer game in, in under six months. Um, for the game devs, that's totally insanity. Mm -hmm. um, unless you worked at Naughty Dog, then that's normal. Um, so we, we, we were crunching super hard and I had this one guy on my team, he was a networking engineer and he was kind of, I could kind of tell he was like on the edge, he was having some problems and around 2 a.m. one day, I just heard him screaming in a room, just screaming. And I walk in and I'm like, what's happening? And he's screaming at a PlayStation. He's just screaming at the top of his lungs. He's like, ah, ah, like not even curse words, just incoherent, just like full rage. And so I walked over and I went to his desk and I picked up his keys and I picked him up from behind and I dragged him out and I kicked the door on the elevator and I pushed him in and I threw his keys and I said, don't come back. And and he went home, and he didn't come back the next day, and he came back the day after that, and he was fine. Um, but that's when I realized that, that, that the creative industry can, can, the entertainment industry can break you, and you really need to take care of yourself. You need to find other things outside of, yeah. of, of being creative or, or, or being a programmer. If you're a programmer, be creative. If you're creative, maybe try something more left brain. You need to have something uh, more work-life balance, be that your family or hiking or being outside or, yeah. or some sort of hobby. Um, but even then, when your work-life balance finally gets to a good point, which mine kind of was, your passion meter can still kind of start to drain. And so you need to find ways to refill your passion meter. Coming to Full sales is actually my number one way to refill my passion yeah. meter. But even for me, I was starting to get to a point um, about seven, eight months ago where I was starting to realize I was, I was starting to burn out on games. So 
the game industry, the average career in the game industry is four years. Um, so you go four years and then you're like, oh, I'm done and you get out. So guys like Keith who have been making games for as long as they have, they're, they're an oddity. Um, and so I got to a point where I was realizing my passion meter was coming down and I was going to start not liking my job. I was going to burn out. And so my answer was to, to just leave and it just takes six months to wander around the planet and work on farms and do non game industry things, non creative industry things. Um, and then coming here, I'm like, okay, I'm ready. I'm ready to get back in it. Um, and, but, but I still have this whole host of other hobbies and things that I do outside of, of work. I think that when you're here, this is what you do 100%. When you get out of, out of school the first two years, probably still want it to be about, about 90 to 100%. But around the two-year mark, you need to start leveling it out with other things in your life because otherwise you're going to burn out. And then you'll have spent all this money and all this time and all of your genius um, to come to full sale. And then you will be like working in a bank somewhere. So... Yeah, I don't know if anybody else has. I mean, I I've, I found the same. Um, when I left school, I was doing 100 hours a week, 120 hours a week, and uh, I didn't have any social life uh, really for more than two years. I think it was really about five years before I was able to yeah. settle in yeah. And, yeah. and really... It was six for me. And, and find, a, find a balance. And even then, there wasn't much of a balance. Um, now, I, I moved to L.A. about two years ago. Now I have a bit more of a balance and part of that was also working my way up to a job that gave me the freedom to do what I want. Now yeah. I wake up when I want, I go to the studio when I feel like uh, and it, you know, at the end of the day I have deliverables. If I have an album to mix or a record to do it, it mm. you know, I can't wait all year to do it. I have to get it done, but I get it done when I want. And you know, um, what I've found is, you know, I mix from home most of the time now, which is, which is great. Uh, so I'll wake up, if I wake up at 7 a.m., I might mix for four hours and then I'll go out and go hiking or whatever, come back, uh, mix a little more and then, you know, go out and do what people do late norm night in norm LA. What normal humans normal do. People. Yeah. Pretend I, to be a normal human. Yeah. Go, I, I, you know. What is the sunlight? I mean, <laughs> and, and also working music is probably a little bit different. I mean, half of working with artists is socializing and whatever. So now I have a, a pretty uh, fairly healthy social life. Uh, but it took a while to get there. It, it didn't, it, it was really when I moved to LA is when I sort of gave myself the freedom to, to do what I felt. I, I think I to just, just to reiterate what you're saying, and because I don't think I said it quite clearly enough, we put our dues in. We worked super hard for yeah. two years, five years, six years, however long it was, to get ourselves to a place where we were able to you know take more time you know and and now that i'm doing like consulting work and stuff like that it's like i pick the clients that i want i work when i want but i mean i worked my ass off to get there mm -hmm. for nine years so yeah it, it's, it, it's more about staying motivated as yeah. opposed to you come out of school you can easily work you know 20 hours a day for uh, you know, forever. And, I mean, again, you, you know, love it. Uh, yeah. yeah, and you love it. And again, uh, you know, I, I was lucky enough to start a small business with a group of, of close friends and we became close friends. You spend 20 <laughs> hours a day with somebody. <laughs> become very close. Love them or hate them. Well, it's funny. Rick Burris actually said the other, the other morning, like the, the five people you spend the most time with are the people that you become the most like. If you like them, if you don't like them, if you're, yeah. they're your friends, they're not, they're your family, they're not. It doesn't matter. It's that proximity you rub off on each other. Uh, and I think that's just like very, that's, that's real wisdom because like you do, you sort of become these people that you spend time with. And it's great if those are people that you really like and those are people that you get along with. But even if you don't, um, you know, it's like those those first few years. You're gonna you're gonna spend a lot of time with each other. You're gonna get to know each other very well. But then, yeah, it is important. It's important to sort of break into a rhythm that's sustainable. It's a sprint to start off with, but then it becomes a marathon. I mean, you have to pace yourself, and you have to understand that like you can't work like that all the time. Um, I guess that's where television is different than features a little bit. We're used to running marathons. That's what we do. Features are much more of a sprint, but those guys will take six months off in between, right. in between movies, and there is no six months off for us. We work a 13-month year. So. And no one's going to tell you when that time is to take time off. I mean, it, this, this industry will eat you alive if you let it. Yeah. Uh, Grant is an odd producer and actually telling someone to go home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good for you, Grant. <laughs> All right, so we're going to throw it out to uh, the students um, to ask some questions. If you are here in the audience, just raise your hand and 
the someone will make, bring a microphone to you if you are listening to us online. Uh, if you'll just uh, let give your question in the into the online forum and the moderator moderator will facilitate that. All right, what questions do we have, guys? Comments, concerns, criticisms. Yes. <laughs> Here they come. Thoughts, feedback uh, for our well-being. Uh, thoughts, anything. theories on Game of Thrones. Yeah. Theories on Game of Thrones. That's, what's <laughs> that's, that's all I want to talk about. So, so got a lot of Game of Thrones <laughs> theory <laughs> question would be. I've never <laughs> seen an episode of Game of Thrones. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. We can really all gang up on him right now, and we can <laughs> yeah. get the answers, the answers are all right here. <laughs> we need everything. And the question was, I wanted to know what it was something you maybe did that you wish you hadn't done, or something you hadn't done that you wish you had done for all of you that was a big regret for you. Mm. Or if not a regret, something a little less harsh than the word regret. I'll tell you what, make done. sure your computer is always password protected, and uh, <laughs> that it's not just the logout password, but the screensaver password too. Word. You might type that in 100 times a day, but trust me, it's worth typing in 100 <laughs> times a day. Is that all you have to say about that? I'm not gonna tell you why that is. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you why that is, but uh, you, you know, my life may have gone in a different direction if that, uh, <laughs> that screensaver was just locked. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty practical advice. I have no uh, real regrets. Um, I've certainly made mistakes uh, over my career, but at the end of the day, I, I learned from them, yeah. and they were valuable. So um, I, I can't think of anything that I would have done differently, honestly. Um, yeah, I, I think I, I like to, it's cliche to say, like, have no regrets, but I think a lot of wisdom and, and growing older is realizing that the mistakes you make are what make you who you are. And even if those mistakes are painful and, and, and you hate that about yourself and you hate that, you need to embrace that and say, yeah. that's who, that's what made me who I am today. Um, I think for me, it's, it's similar. It's like, I just, uh, save and back everything up <laughs> yep. uh, because, because there's nothing worse than yeah. working for uh, weeks and then an intern accidentally <sighs> deleting the yeah. depot. Yep. Um, of 150 people. Yeah. I don't regret that, but he did. <laughs> <laughs> Fun note, though, we still hired that guy, and he is amazing. Yeah. So even though he literally fucked 200 <laughs> people over yeah. for like 48 hours. Let it out. Yeah. <laughs> we hired him. We hired him because he was still good. And he, he was like, instantly he was like, I messed up. I messed up. Like, come fix this problem. And we Own fixed it. it. Yeah. But, you know, he I know he doesn't it, so. regret that yeah. because also now everybody knew, in the studio knew who he was. And then they were like, wait, what do you do here? Why did you do that? And then we were like, oh, yeah, you're actually really good. So, we <laughs> so he should regret that, but he doesn't. <laughs> I, I mean, a super similar answer is, is like our paths could not be planned out. So it's, it's really hard for me to say, like, oh, I wish I'd done this differently because then all these things would yeah. be different. Yeah. I have no idea what my next month is going to be like, let alone the next year. Uh, lessons from other people that I've watched. Um, don't address your email when you're sending an angry email until you've proofread it. Uh, and always double check who you're sending an email to. I've seen so. Un that's that's actually great. Huh? Don't yeah. reply all. Yeah, don't don't oh, reply yeah. all. Uh, Epic Games has a lot of mail lists, and I've seen way too many people send the absolute worst types of emails to an entire like the entire industry is on this mail list. Yeah. Basically, yeah, uh, it wasn't. And so I've seen a lot of people actually lose jobs doing stuff like that. <laughs> I had somebody do that and they accidentally sent me the game design doc for their new project, <laughs> their entire game design doc. And I was like, um, I don't work with you. But thanks for this game design doc. Here's a few things I would change. <laughs> I mean, I have like a hard, fast rule of like, don't put anything, write anything down. Like, just talk, just call people. I mean, that's just our incredibly paranoid industry and the yeah. fact that I'm full of secrets. Um, but, you know, like, I just call people, you know? Like, I actually think we undervalue in our society now just talking to people on the phone. Yeah. Like, that connection, don't be afraid to call people. Don't also be afraid to approach people. Like, again, don't be annoying. And if if you see, you know, let's say, a celebrity or something at a, you know, if you find yourself at a party with that them, advice okay. doesn't work, by the way. It doesn't. I found. No. You can't tell somebody to not be annoying. <laughs> That's either, a good point. They don't. They know. either are. They don't they know. Are. You're right. No, yeah. you're absolutely right. They are not <laughs> self-aware enough. Maybe what I meant to say is like, don't immediately go up and ask for a selfie uh, if it's somebody. Unless but you're like, Leslie. Unless you're Leslie, and then do because that's just what you people expect it from him. Um, <laughs> unless you've won 18 Grammys, do not do, do that. Do not do that. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Until you're a few Grammys deep, then. <laughs> 
then, yeah. okay, then all right, and then all right. If you can say this one time, Michael Jackson and I, <laughs> yeah. um, then okay, all right, then that's fine. But until you get to that point, um, you know, but don't be afraid to approach people. Yeah. You know, like uh, the funny thing is, is like, uh, you know, the, the more recognized this is not an example of me. But the more recognized I think you get in, in your industry, uh, the less people are willing to sort of just come up and say, hey, I, I like what you work on. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to say hi. People don't really do that. Um, and I think people respond when you aren't going to say like, hey, what can you do for me? Selfie, autograph, tell me about the secret from the show or whatever. Um, if you could just say like, hey, I'm, I'm a big fan of what you do. I just want to, you know, I just want to say hi, you know? It's very and that's, that's a huge difference of going up to you and me asking you for something versus me giving you that's something. That's exactly right. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, just just think about if that was you, what would what would you want and like that's often the right call, you know? I think I think one thing that's really interesting too about what all of us do, like everybody who goes to full sale tends to be we tend to be behind the scenes. Very rarely are we the the in the limelight. We often, you know, rub shoulders with people who, you know, are household names, but we aren't. And especially in the game industry, like mm -hmm. other than like Kojima, like and like you know Miyamoto, like most people have no idea who any of the, us are. I have no idea. Yeah, who are. I'm sorry. <laughs> Get out. No. Uh, so sound, when, you, when awesome. you walk up and you you know somebody's story and you know what they do, you know you were talking about this earlier, and you walk up and you say, "I'm a big fan of your work." Like I'm like, when someone says that to me, I'm like, "You know who I am?" <laughs> yeah. And like we all like to be flattered, it doesn't matter. That's just how society works. Absolutely. You don't, you know. You you said you, you this is weird for you, but you still like it a little bit, you know. So when someone walks up it's to you, just because I like swivel. Yeah. A bit. When someone <laughs> walks up to you and says, you know, I really like the the mix you did on this song, and you're like, oh, thanks. Yeah. All right. Okay. Do we have time for another question, or are we wrapping up? <laughs> oh, wow. Uh, there was one, we one, killed one question. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Yeah. 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 Uh, they Gals, should have not put the four of us here. together. <laughs> Bonus question, lightning round question. Who has a Can question we, we can answer in like 10 yeah. words? All right. <laughs> Swivel's fast, he'll answer. He's super fast. <laughs> yeah, I'll knock through these quick. Who we got? I don't know if you could answer this in 10 words, but <laughs> oh, the I question will. I have is, uh, what advice would you give on making a resume after you graduated from Full Sail? Ooh. Go watch my YouTube videos. <laughs> <laughs> Seven words. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> go to career development. Forward. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That one. That one. That one. Hire one. a resume company. That's actually four words, but I only put up. <laughs> no, I. I uh, career. Spell career dev. Go career to dev. career <laughs> development. Next. Career dev. Yeah, Who we got? You speak. Just we can hear you. Um, yeah. So you guys said that um, in the entertainment business, um, you said that pretty much the entertainment could eat you alive and pretty much take your, up your time. How would you balance that between, say, giving time to your family or your significant other without affecting them too much and saying, wow, you know, you're never home? Well, first of all, if they're your significant other, they should understand that your dreams are uh, as important as anything. And you gotta find the time, sure, but uh, especially when you're starting your career, I would hope that whoever you're with would understand and, and be supportive of that. Yeah. Um, really important. It's not like you're 50 years old and you've had a whole career and you've had time to sort of settle in and whatnot. So um, I don't want to give any relationship advice, but if you're having problems in that department, you might want to look somewhere else. Next. <laughs> and Swivel will give that relationship <laughs> advice on the side. Just come yeah. see him after. <laughs> I've seen that before, though, and I've seen yeah. that with a lot of people close to me and some people are really supportive of the work that you do and, and, and understand that your dreams mean a lot and other people aren't and every single time it doesn't work out. So and make it might sure be hard to hear, but you yeah. know, it's- make, make sure you thank those people for supporting you in yeah, that way. Yeah, absolutely. Like it's super important. And yeah. if you work at a good company, we'll thank those people for you as well. Yeah. <laughs> Flower, flowers to spouses. All right, we got more questions. Yes. Couple more, let's get them. we have from online? Yes, this question is from Stevie Online. He's a software development student. He wants to know, what are the first challenges faced when starting and running a dev studio? Oh, when starting and running, I mean, Make money? it quick. 
money. Uh, I yeah. mean, I think I think the first challenge that that I, I've always seen is is just getting the right talent in the building and people that you can deal with for a significant amount of time, um, and then figuring out the time and money. Um, right now, you it's so easy to co-locate and work from all over the world together, so you don't need to worry about an office space or or those things. Or and and setting up a business is so quick and easy relatively depending on what you're trying to do. So it really is finding the right people who have a shared vision and moving forward on that. If you're starting a company for the sake of starting a company without a vision for your first product, don't start a company. Yeah. Good call. Yep. Thank yeah. you. Good. Well said. All right. Enough said, I guess. Huh? All right, we got one more question. This is from okay. Frederick, another online question. He's an audio production grad. He has a question for DJ Swivel. If you can't go the intern route, what would be a good way to get work in the industry? Why can't you go the intern route? <laughs> Can we is, ask? Is he there right questions? now? Can we get an, <laughs> Let's ask him? Okay, so the only way I know how to interpret that is that I can't go the intern route because money or whatever, and I hear that all the time. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's not what this person's saying, but that's what I'm going to assume based on what I've seen before. And the answer is. You can work a full-time job 40 hours a week and still have 80 hours a week to intern. So there's no excuse. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, another question. In the back. Uh, Andrew Hobson, ABC News. Yeah. <laughs> Fake news. Fake, Fake news. <laughs> Sit down. Alternative facts. <laughs> I wanted to know how much of a difference should I expect graduating? Like when you first came in and you have a dream or your idea of what you're going to be when you graduate, how different will it be, you know, where you are compared to where you are now? Sorry, say that again? Like when you first come into Full Sail, you think, oh, I'm going to direct my own movie compared to when you graduate and you hit the real life and that's your job now. How much of a difference is it? It's going to be a lot more work. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, 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 and you have to understand that, you, you know, you're... you're you're going to be the first per when you're hired into your first job, you are now the least qualified person in that yeah. business, right? So here you could be the best student in the whole school, but when when I hire you, you know X number of years less about what I am hiring you for than than I do. Um, but but I think one thing that that I always talk about is when I when I created my what I call I call people's first business cards, their rookie cards. When I created my rookie card, it said uh, programmer, designer, producer, and I got so much flack because people were like, well, what are you? And now I look at them and I said, I've done all of it. I've shipped games with all those titles. So you have those, like you just never drop those goals, right? So you, you look at your path and everything you do should be guiding you to that path or to that ultimate goal. And your goal may change, but you know, just keep it in mind and, and don't do something that isn't leading you in the right direction. And find a way to enjoy every step of it. Yeah. Even when you're doing the, gr the grunt work. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, you have to find your joy in it, for sure. Mm -hmm. Hello there. Um, Mr. Black Tie, I'm sorry, I don't know your name uh, specifically. <laughs> um, or Mr. Black Tie, I like that. <laughs> Call him Mr. Black Tie as well. That's so weird that that's our <laughs> inside Perfect. thing. But, but um, <laughs> I, <was talking> about <laughs> I wanted to ask, when you were talking, you said that you put yourself out there. I wanted to know specifically what you did so that way I could have an idea what to go out when I graduate. Yeah, I mean, I... This is your class, right? <laughs> How, the your, your, your entire yeah, your yeah, entire absolutely. This yep. is this is your specialty. Um, yes. I think it depends on on the industry that you're trying to get into, but every industry has its legs in something. So in games and art, we have a very 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 active online community in all the different specialties and in the broader scope of of uh, art and in game development. Um, what I was doing is I, I put up a website, I made a LinkedIn page, and all like the really the bare essential basics, but then I was just putting up art, and I was going around to different online communities saying like, hey, I'm trying to solve this problem, I've got this piece here, can you guys help me figure out how to, how to get this next step? Uh, and so through that, I just ended up in dialogue with experienced artists and professionals across the entire industry, across film and games, um, and those conversations kind of became the crux of what got me my first leg in. So uh, it, that's, that's a very specific example in my, in my particular industry, but I think that every industry has some form of that. Great. Well, I want to uh, thank all of you for attending, both here in, on campus and online, and especially thank our guests, uh, Grant, Swivel, Keith, and Stephen, um, for your amazing information and insights. <laughs> Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much.
Good job, everybody. Good. What's that? All right. Well Good done. Good job. Good work, guys. Well done. Grant? Pleasure? I enjoy being on panels. I know, brother. Yeah, we should just, uh, let's find a way to do this as our full-time job. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Absolutely.